Hi, everyone. We are joined today again by Dr. Aaron Weinberg, who is a pulmonary critical care and internal medicine doctor, and also the national director of clinical research at Carbon Health, where we will be discussing aneurysms, which we have been getting a lot of questions about. And we have Aaron back with us today who has managed these type of conditions in the intensive care unit. And we're really excited to be able to bring the answers that you have directly to you from physicians who have firsthand experience with this condition. So I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron to just describe briefly what even is an aneurysm. Thanks for having me, Dr. Swanda. So an aneurysm is a balloon-like bulging of a blood vessel. So you, you may have remembered as a kid, you, you blow up a balloon too big and it starts bulging out a little bit too much. Or if you've ever had a garden hose, an old garden hose, where part of it starts wearing down and getting frayed, you may get a ballooning of one of the sidewalls of that hose and it may start growing out or out pouching in that weakened part. We had a lot of questions that were related to all these different types of aneurysms. So what are all the different types that an individual could experience? An aneurysm can happen in a number of different blood vessels. A common location for an aneurysm is the aorta and the aorta is a large artery that brings oxygenated blood from the left side of your heart through your chest, down through your abdomen, and then has a number of different branches that come off of it. And that takes the, the blood that has oxygen in it and brings it to your tissues and your organs. So it's a vital blood vessel. This blood vessel is under enormous pressure throughout your life. If you remember your blood pressure, if you have good control blood pressure, it may be 120 over 80. So 120 millimeters of mercury uh, is going through that blood vessel throughout your life. And then obviously, if you have high blood pressure, that pressure goes up even further. So that puts a good amount of stress on that blood vessel. So aneurysms can occur in this blood vessel. And depending on which part of the aorta it's located in determines what we call it. So if it's in the chest region, that's called a thoracic aortic aneurysm. If it's located lower down in your abdomen or your belly region, that's called an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now there are other kinds of aneurysms as well. There's aneurysms that can occur in the blood vessels of your brain that can lead to stroke. Aneurysms can also occur sometimes in your leg vessels. Uh, so there's different kinds that can occur. Okay, great. And for the purpose of today's talk, let's focus on the aortic aneurysms. And so how common actually are these two different types of aortic aneurysms? Yeah, they're, they're pretty common. You know, there's about anywhere from five to 10 cases per 100,000 people in the US. And that leads to approximately 10 to 15,000 deaths annually from this condition. Okay, well, wow, that's a lot of individuals who can be affected just in the United States alone. And we had some individuals who were commenting on aortic aneurysms related to rupture versus dissection. Could you describe those two terms for us? Sure. So over time, that ballooning that we described or that aneurysm that occurs in a blood vessel undergoes continuous pressure as fluid is flowing through it. And that can put additional stress to the wall of that blood vessel. Sometimes there could be a tear in the inner part of that blood vessel. And then what ends up happening is the blood then tracks down within the wall of the blood vessel. So it doesn't completely leave the blood vessel, but a tear occurs in the inner wall. Blood starts tracking down within the blood vessel and that's called a dissection. And a lot of times patients become symptomatic when they have a dissection. Now, if the tear goes completely through both the inner and the outer walls, that can lead to rupture of the blood vessel or aneurysm rupture, and that can cause massive, rapid, and fatal internal bleeding. And do you have any signs and symptoms of dissection and rupture or even just of aneurysms in general? We can talk about the symptoms because they vary depending on what location the aneurysm is in. But I think one thing I'd like to point out first is that 60% of deaths due to aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection actually happen in men, interestingly. And deaths from aortic aneurysm can happen from either dissection or complete rupture. So 
When we're talking about, you know, the signs and symptoms of this condition, if it happens in the thoracic aortic aneurysm, meaning the aneurysm that's in the chest, then someone can experience sharp, sudden pain in their chest or even in their upper back. Sometimes they experience shortness of breath or trouble swallowing. And men and women are equally likely to have this kind of aneurysm in the chest. And it actually increases with age. So the older we get, the, the higher likelihood it is that we'll have that. Now, if the aneurysm occurs in the abdominal region or the belly region, the symptoms are a little bit different. These aneurysms tend to happen or are more common in those that are 65 and older, and they tend to happen more commonly in men. And the main symptoms are a throbbing or a deep pain in the, the stomach that can radiate to the back or even the side. And the pain can sometimes extend down to the buttocks, the groin, or even the legs. And I know that in the beginning, you mentioned the causes of aneurysm with that ballooning. I think that was a really great analogy for people to put a visual of what's actually happening at such a small scale within our blood vessels. But what actually puts somebody at risk of having an aneurysm? So the risks may be a little bit different depending on the location of the aneurysm, but thoracic aneurysms, it's usually caused by high blood pressure or a sudden injury or trauma. So if you have got into a massive car accident, that can sometimes cause an aneurysm and a rupture. So sometimes also people have inherited connective tissue disorders, genetic conditions. Some common ones are Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that puts them at high risk. And connective tissue, I, I describe it as it's kind of like the scaffolding in our body. They support a lot. Of, it supports a lot of our structures. And it's also in the walls of our blood vessels. It maintains the integrity of that blood vessel. So any condition that weakens that scaffolding uh, can lead to loss of integrity and aneurysm or ballooning of the blood vessel. So that's with thoracic aneurysms. Now with abdominal aortic aneurysms, it's caused by factors that harden our blood vessels. So similar risks to heart disease, you know, high blood pressure and cholesterol can play a role over time. Smoking is also a very big risk factor. 75% of abdominal aneurysms are attributed to smoking. I'll also note there are certain infections as well as trauma that can also cause abdominal aortic aneurysms. With a variety of these different risk factors that can affect a lot of individuals and you know, the, quite the high number of individuals who can be affected by an aortic aneurysm just in the US alone, I think it leads to maybe one of the most questions that individuals had, and maybe we can leave it on a positive note of how can we treat these or even prevent these from happening in the first place? As Benjamin Franklin once famously said, an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure. And there are measures that one can take working with their primary care clinician to lower their risk. Things that harden our blood vessels can lead to it, like I mentioned. So reducing your blood pressure, working with your clinician to get, get your diet, as well as if you need to be on any meds to lower your blood pressure, that's important. Getting your cholesterol under control as well as important and quitting smoking that that's another big one now now someone with a strong family history of aneurysm or with a known connective tissue disorder they may require closer monitoring and maybe even screening over time to to make sure that they don't develop or progress surgery may also play a role after you've been diagnosed with an aneurysm depending on the location and type as well as your overall condition and for those that are diagnosed during a life-threatening dissection or rupture that that requires usually emergent surgery uh, and time is of the essence in those cases now one other thing I'll, I'll mention is based on the u.s preventative services task force they recommend that men between the ages of 65 to 75 years of age who have smoked should get at least one screening ultrasound for abdominal aortic aneurysm, even if they have no symptoms. So that's another preventative measure in the right demographic group. So just to be clear, if somebody does meet this criteria, where could they go first to begin getting some answers to their questions? Yeah, so I would start by going to your primary care clinician, mention to them you have a smoking history, you fall between those age groups and, and you know, ask them about getting a screening ultrasound and they'll be able to refer you to a radiology suite. In general, even if you don't meet those criteria, I would talk to your, your primary care physician about, you know, measures you can take to get your blood pressure under control, get your cholesterol under control. 
and also what tools could potentially use to help yourself quit smoking. Well, this was perfect. I want to thank you, Aaron, for coming on yet again to answer more questions. Again, this is part of our ongoing series with Carbon Health to bring more health information and health science to the general public. So keep submitting your questions, keep giving your topic recommendations, so that way we can keep providing that information to everyone. So we look forward to chatting with everyone again soon about our next topic. So thank you very much. See you.